So this Judges uh, starts with the after the death of Joshua. So what are the things that we have to actually question ourselves? When Moses was uh, leading the Israelites in the desert, and when he was about to die, God told Moses to appoint the successors, which was Joshua. So Joshua um, took the roles uh, of leading the Israelites after Moses died. But one thing we're questioning as we read this book is that why didn't God told Joshua to appoint another successor? There is no mention that God is actually telling Joshua to appoint another leaders after him. Why? If God actually told Moses to appoint the next leader, why didn't God actually tell Joshua to appoint next leaders after Joshua died? I want you to think about it. Why? So you have to look at the difference between Moses and Joshua. Moses was leading the Israel Israelites and led the Israelites out of uh, Egypt and brought them out to wilderness. And that's where Moses died. But after Moses died, Joshua actually took over from Moses and led the Israelites from wilderness into the prom promised land, which is a Canaan. So what it's really telling us is that Moses represent the first coming of Jesus and Joshua is represent the, the returning Jesus to lead uh, the chosen people to the promised land. So then who comes after Joshua? Nobody. Once we in once we in the into the uh, promised land, there's no more. There's no more successor. So therefore there's no successor of J Joshua because there's no one else is going to come and lead the Israelites. They're in the promised land. That's it. Once Jesus comes and we all going to resurrect and he's going to lead us into the uh, his rest and bring us to uh, heaven and there's no more after that. That's the end. There's no more successor. So what it really showing us is that Jesus is the end of everything. There's no more successor. So this is why God did not tell Joshua to appoint the next leader because there is no such thing as a next leader after Jesus. And then after Joshua died, since there is no more uh, next leader, um, Joshua, uh, not, not Joshua, the uh, Judah asked the Lord, Now, since Joshua died, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? So Judah, Judah was actually the biggest uh, tribe of all, and the bravest of, of all. He's the one who actually asked the Lord who should go up. And the Lord said, Judah, you go up. So he was actually going up. And when he was going up, instead of going up by himself, he actually asked Simeon to come along with Judah. Now the question is, why Simeon?
Do you see this chart? I actually shared this chart with you guys, you know, a while back when we were studying uh, numbers. So when you look at this table, this is Numbers Chapter 1, and this is number Chapter 26. So this is the first when they uh, had the census, when they counted the, the people. And then right before they enter into the Promised Land, they counted the people again. So this is the a difference between the first count versus the second count. So when you look at the uh, these are the, all the uh, tribes, okay. So when you look at the number of the tr uh, tribes here, look at the Judah. When they counted for the first time, Judah was about seventy-four thousand six hundred people. When you look at the second count, the seventy-six thousand five hundred. They actually increase about the difference is about nineteen hundred. So they increase if. Because th this count, the 74,600, that's the first generation, right? So they all died in a desert. This the second count is the, the second generation. Either they, they came out of Egypt when they were very little, or they were born in the, uh, in the, the wilderness here. So when they enter into the promised land, they actually number increase about 1900 so the total number was a 76,500 when you look at this every tribes over here Judah is the biggest when you look at this number you see this let's take a look at Simeon when they counted first 59,300 right when they enter look at this number 22,200. The difference is they actually have 37,100 people short compared to the first count versus the second count. But when you look at the number of all the tribes, Simeon is the smallest, which means Judah is the strongest. Simeon is the weakest. I'll give you a hint here. First of all, why did Simeon actually, the number is just so small compared to other um, tribes? I mean, literally we, we learned some stuff here. What 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 happened? If you remember going back numbers, right before they enter into the promised lands, there's some big incident that occurred. What is that big incident? Anyone? Turn to Numbers chapter 25. When you take a look at the uh, Numbers chapter 25, this is how it starts. While Israel lived in Sittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. Because of who? Yeah, but who, who who actually did this? Correct. It's because of the Baal. Right? The Baal is the one who actually, you know, used the Moabite woman to uh, seduce the Israelites. And because of that incidence, many people died so when you look at the uh, chapter 25 verse 8 and on it says this 
and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman, through her belly. Though the plague on the people of Israel was stopped, nevertheless, those who died by the plague were twenty-four thousand. So how many people died? Twenty-four thousand. When you look at the Simeons, how many people reduce? So what does that really tell you? Not all, but there is a good number of a people from Simeons actually was involved. So what does that tell you? They actually abandoned God and followed other women and worship other God, right? So it basically tell you that many of the people from the Simeon tribe, they're the sinner. Okay, Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. Yes? Okay, so the strongest, the Judah, where Jesus comes from, is actually telling the weakest and the most wicked people in the tribe is asking them to come along with me and when you look at the actually the judges there's no mention that the Simeon actually fought against the uh, the Canaanites it's pretty much Judah is the one who's a fighting and he's the one they're the one who actually conquered the the land so what does that tell you the Jesus is bringing the sinners and asking come with me and I I will fight for you and then he gives the lands to Simeon so Simeon literally tag along with Judah and then gets the land they didn't do anything Judah is the one who actually fought against the enemies but they just got the land for free so that is Literally what it's symbolizing is that Jesus was leading the sinner like us and then He fights for us and then literally he gives us the land So when you actually look at this number, it's very easily tell so I'll show you another map See the map? Okay, so this is the, the Judah. And then below Judah, there's a Simeon. Right? So Judah is the one who actually, you know, brought the Simeon along with them and pretty much a fouth fought for them and gave that land to them but look at the land when you compare it to other lands they're quite big you know Manasseh took actually a large portion of the land but this Simeon is not small either when you look at the Ephraim, Dan, uh, Benjamin, Rubens and, and, and Gad and Zubalun, Naphtali, Eshers and Issachar I mean, the land that they possessed was not small at all. But the question is, Judah was... Judah is the one who actually fought for the Simeon. And he didn't have to... He didn't have to bring the Simeons because Judah is a strong enough and if you remember the story of Caleb, he was the one who actually asked uh, Joshua, give me this land that nobody wants, right? 
but the land that he that he requests is not an easy land is the land that he requested was like in a very uh strong people are living in the hardest part of the whole land that, that nobody want nobody wanted it. it and when they went up they actually took the uh Adoni Besek. Adoni means the Lord. So Adoni Besek means Lord of Besek is what it means. So he's the king of Besek. And this guy it was used to be a pretty strong king. When uh Judah actually uh overpowered him and he, they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. And then Judah captured Adoni Bezek and actually cut his thumbs and cut his toes. And when you look at the story here, uh, verse 7, and Adoni Bezek said the seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. So he actually did this to seventy other kings before this happened. So when you look at this, his confessions that he was a very strong man and his people were very strong. So they cut seventy kings thumbs and toes. But now he's in the same situation as what he used to do to other kings. So the how did God, uh, how did actually Judah was able to defeat them? When you look at the verse 2, it's, there's answers to it. So when you read in verse 2, the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. So which means it is not because of Judah was the largest number and uh, the bravest number of all but God is the one who's promised that I'll give this land to you all you have to do is just advance in you'll be able to win this battle so it was God who actually gave the land to Judah yes Judah was very strong they were very brave for sure but not because they were strong not because they were brave they were able to actually defeat the uh, uh, Besek, because the God gave that land to Judah, and they just trusted it, and they were able to actually, you know, uh, took the land. An interesting part is the the confession of Adoni Besek. When you look at the verse seven at the end, he said, "As I have done, so God has repaid me." And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. So what he's confessing is, listen, I actually, I actually cut seventy other kings' thumbs and toes. So because I have done this, God is repaying me that He cuts off my thumbs and and toes. So he's saying. For what I've, whatever I have done, God is repaying me. So then I'm actually getting paid for what I have done. But you have to be very careful of this confession. This confession seems to be very um, fair. So, you know, whatever you had done, you will get paid for what you had done. So... Let's take a look at um, Jeremiah chapter 50. Let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50 and we're going to read verse 15 
it says, raise a shout against her all around. She has surrendered. Her bulwarks have fallen. Her walls are thrown down. For this is the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance on her. Do to her as she had done. What is he saying? Do, yes, do to her as she has done. So which means, this is what you had done before, and you get paid for what you had done. So God will repay for what you have done. But take a look at the, this time, the Romans. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Let's read from um, verse 1. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do not uh, do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, but because of your hard and impatient heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the days of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one's according to his work. What is he saying? You will render to each one according to his work. So literally, just like what we just read, you will get paid for what you have done. So think about it. If, if we have to get paid for what we have done, what will be the judgments we will receive? If we, take t if we get paid for what we have done, what will be the verdict for us? <laughs> exactly. Death. So then the question is, can we bear that? C can you actually be responsible for what you have done? Well, certainly, we certainly don't want to be judged for what we have done. Although we have done wrong, right, we deserve to be, you know, um, deserve to die, but we don't want to die. So what did we do? <laughs> so what we did was we asked for we ask for forgiveness, pretty much, right? We're just claiming that I don't want to die. I want to live. So what can I do to live? Well, believe in Jesus and ask for forgiveness and you will be forgiven, right? So instead of getting paid for what we have done, since we don't want to die, we ask for forgiveness and we believe in Jesus to actually cleanse my sins and wash our sins with his precious blood. So we're not taking the things that we have done. But what Adoni Besek did was, okay, that's what I had done in the past. God is repaying me. I'll take it because I deserve. If I, if I take that position... <laughs> That's literally eternal death. 
and I certainly don't want that. So what did I choose to do? And I come to the Lord and said, Lord, I certainly deserve to die, but I don't want to die. I come to you. Save me. Forgive me. I want to live. And the people who wants to live and who comes to Jesus, what did Jesus do? He cleansed our sins and he opened the path for us to live. Right? So we're, we refuse to die and we refuse, refuse to just, you know, get paid for what we have done. But rather we ask for forgiveness so, so we want to live. That's all we did. We all ask for the forgiveness, and we want to live. So what, what, what's the way for us to live? Believe in Jesus Christ. Because that's the only path that he opened the door for us. So whoever believes in him shall not perish. But most of people say, I deserve for what I had done. And when, when they take that position, like I said, you're basically sentencing yourself to eternal death. There's no, there's no way for you to live. But we certainly don't want that. So we're telling it. We're telling everyone, don't die. Don't die. There's a way for you to live. So then people may ask, what can I do to live? And believe in Jesus Christ then your sins will be forgiven. But for those of people who doesn't believe, what do you mean that I have to just believe in Jesus? Uh, I deserve to die. Then, literally, you will die. So it all depends upon how much desire to live. Do you really want to die or do you want to live? So, here's what God says. When you look at the uh, Ezekiel chapter 5, 33. Ezekiel chapter We're going to read from verse 10. Ezekiel chapter 33 from verse 10. And you, son of man, says, say to the house of Israel, Though have you said, Surely our transgression and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but th but that the wicked turns from his way and live, turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? What is he saying? He doesn't want anyone, even wicked, to die. So God is saying, why do you want to die? I'm open the door for you. Come to me, then you shall live. So, although we all deserve to die, because we want to live, we came to Jesus and asked for forgiveness. That's how we were able to live. And this particular chapter 1's story is exactly telling us that. If you say, I'll take the responsibility for what I have done, you're literally going to actually have eternal death. There's no salvation. For, for those of the people who wants to live, you will come to Jesus. Alright, so verse 8. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem, and captured it, and struck it with the edge of the sword, and set the city on fire. And afterward the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country in the Negeb and in the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly 
Kiryas Arba, and they defeated uh, Shishai and Ahiman and Talmai. So as I said before, when you read this context, there's no mention that Simeon did anything. It is all Judah who fought against the Canaanites. So that tells us that Jesus is the one who fights for us, not not us. From there they went against the inhabitants of Deber. The name of Deber was for merely Kiriath the Sefer. And Caleb said, He who attacks Kiriath the Sefer and captured it, I will give him Aksa, my daughters, for a wife, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brothers, captured it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field, and she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have set me in the land of Negev, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. So this story was actually, we studied in Joshua, right? So, um, let's see, where was it? So when you go back to Joshua chapter 15, uh, the story from verse 13 through 19 is the same exact story. So this just explains what that story is about. So as I mentioned, what is uh, Caleb's daughter wanted it? She wanted it. She wanted a springs. So she said, "I want the blessing." So what do you what do you want? So I want the springs. And Caleb gave her upper springs and uh, the lower springs. So that's why I told you before. What do we really need? And what is the true blessing that we need in our life? Is the work of the Holy Spirit is what we really need. In verse sixteen. And the descendants of uh, Kenites, Moses' a father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palm into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev uh, near Arad. And they went and settled with the people. And Judah went with Simeon his brother, and they defeated the Canaanites who inhabited Zephoth and devoted to destruction. So the name of the city was called Horma. Judah also captured Gaza with its territory, and Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory, and the Lord was with Judah, and he took possessions of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. And Hebron was given to Caleb, and Moses had said, and he drove out from it the three sons of Anak, but the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this city. The house of Joseph also went up against the Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph scouted out Bethel. Now the name of the city was formerly Luz. And the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to them, Please show us the way into the city, and we will deal kindly with you. And he showed them the way into the city, and they struck the city with the edges of the sword. But they let the man and all his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites, and built the city, and called his name Luz. That is its name to this day. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of uh, Abilim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites persisted in the dwelling in the land. When 
Israel grew strong. They put the Canaanites to forge the labor, but did not drive them out completely. And Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer, so the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Zubalun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Napalo, so the Canaanites lived among them, but became subject to forced labor. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Echo, or the inhabitants of Sidon, or the Aleph, or of uh, Akzib, or of, or of Helba, or the Epic, of, or of Re Rehob. So the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, and inhabitants of the land of Fordi did not drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth uh, Shemesh, or the inhabitants of Be Beth Anath. So they lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and the Beth Anath became subject to forced labor for them. The Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. The Amorites persisted in dwelling in the mount to here, and Ajalon, Ajalon and uh, Shalbim, but the hand of the house of Joseph rested heavily on them, and they became subject to forced labor, and the border of the Amorites ran from the ascendant of Akrabim from Sela and upward. Okay, so as I was reading this stories, what do you see in this story? Right. So the question is this. Number one. God said, I'm going to drive them out. God said, he's going to drive them out. But, he was not able to drive them out. Why? Um, take a look at the verse 19 here. And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possessions of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain, because they had chariots of iron. Why Judah was not able to drive the these people out because they have chariots and irons so the, then our question is didn't God did God know about this God or God already knew that they already have chariots and irons that's not something that he didn't know he knew that they had chariots and irons so God told them I'm going to drive them out, and you'll be able to drive them out. But Judah could not drive them out because they have irons and chariots. So, even Caleb and the Judean was a strong, but because they did not truly believe in the Lord to drive them out, because they were afraid, and there was a reason they're saying we could not drive out because they have irons, because they have chariots. So what it means is that you're fighting uh, your enemy. Your, your enemy has tanks and your enemy has like, you know, very strong weapons, but you don't have that strong weapons on your side. So they had a good reason because our enemies has the you know most advanced uh weapons that we cannot really you know overpower them, therefore we could not drive them out, but that's not what God said. 
God said, you will be able to drive them out. But because they did not sorely trust the Lord that they, be, they were able to do it, and they could not do it. So when you look at the whole uh, chapter 1, all these tribes could not drive the inhabitants of Canaanites. Which means every one of them, including Judah, had failed. Every single of them failed. What does it tell us? As I told you from the beginning, what is this judge is teaching us? Mm -hmm. Correct. Even strongest and biggest tribe of all, Judah, could not do it himself. They had a very strong leader. Caleb was the leader. But still, they could not drive out the inhabitants. What is really teaching us is that no matter how strong you are, no matter, no matter who you are, you won't be able to do it by yourself if you don't sorely trust the Lord when you trust the Lord and when you actually walk with the Lord you will be able to actually drive them out but if you don't trust him you you will always fail so the Bible and especially judges teaching us you will fail if you try to do it by yourself you have to trust the Lord, you have to work with the Lord, and you have to trust His promise at every situation. So imagine, you trust the Lord, and we all trust the Lord. But when the hard situation comes, what do we rely on? <laughs> you know, we, we, yeah, we, we tend to rely on our the people we know what we have you know my connections you know we rely on a lot of things besides the lord 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 is not the one who actually comes to my mind first or something else that comes to my mind we look at our parents we look at our friends we look at the people we know who could help me to get through these problems so all although we say that we trust the lord when it comes to you know a situation like this we always try to look for our own own way to get out of this it's very very easy and it's easy traps we fall into and yeah mhm mm yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, we do think about the Lord, but the Lord is not the first thing that it comes to our mind. After we try many different things and I realize, oh, I have to go back to the Lord. You know, so that means Lord is not at the top priority and he's not at the top trust list. So we trust all the people around us who can provide us help and then you know below the list and it say we remember oh we have to go go to uh, the Lord and ask him so that tells us how much we trust him so the person or the things that it comes to our mind is the one that we trust the most <laughs> that could be they could be your friends they could be your parents they could be someone you know all right it doesn't really matter what it is but whatever you rely on is pretty much what you actually trust the most so the situations like I told you before you know the coronavirus broke up here what do you look for hmm? yeah so that's the reality even though we say as we trust the Lord and we, even though we confess you know we you know we you know always ask the lord 
yes we do have that in mind it's not like we don't we do but what we trust the most is not the Lord we always trust something else so when there's a something that we need to to get help and that's the help that we really look for and that's what we trust the most we're not much different so when when you read this chapter one and look at all these tribes and doing what they're doing and they did not uh, they were they were not a, uh, able to drive out the inhabitants of a uh, Canaanites and you may say why why didn't they actually drive out all this uh, you know inhabitants and you have to look at yourself it's like you're it's it's like you're looking on the mirror <laughs> that's that's me <laughs> that's me so they it's not like they did not drive the people out they did it just they did not completely drive them out so they're always inhabitants are living among them and that's exactly the same thing it's not like we don't trust the Lord we do trust the Lord but we don't sorely trust the Lord so we drive them out but we leave the room for other inhabitants to live among us so when you read the story this story is a pretty much the entire book of the judges so let's take a look at chapter 2 now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgar to Bukim, and he said I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers I said I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land you shall break down their altars but you have not obeyed my voice what is this you have done so now I say I will not drive them out before you but they shall become thorns in your sides and their gods shall be a snare to you as soon as the angel of the Lord spoke to these world words to all the people of Israel the people lifted up their voices and wept and they called the name of that place Bokim and they sacrificed there to the Lord so what is actually angel saying to them angel is saying to them I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give it to your fathers and I said I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land you shall break down their altar but you have not obeyed my voice and what is this you have done so you can see from this what their failure was right even though God gave the promise and a covenant and said I will drive them out but they did not sorely trust so they trusted their own power and then they left the inhabitants of living among them so they said like it's okay it's not we don't have to drive them all out let them live among us but what is the angel says it will be your thorn and they'll be your snare to you that's exactly that's exactly what happened to them so why is that happening because that's who we are even though we trust the Lord there is always a room in our heart that we trust other things that's us we always you know live among you know all with all this inhabitants that we don't trust so they cried out and they wept so then okay so you wept so what's next right so they wept okay so they called the Bokim what does that Bokim means Bokim Bokim means it's a weep yeah there there is a weep okay so y you wept so then what what changed <laughs> exactly you wept but nothing you just wept that's it there's no change whatsoever so what's the point of uh, 
you know, weeping here. You just showed your tears. Okay, great. So, you still did not drive them out. So, doesn't mean anything. And they actually uh, sacrifice for the Lord. But that was it. Nothing more, nothing less. Verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel, when each to his uh, inheritance to take possessions of the land, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, had died at the age of 110 years old. And they buried him with the boundaries of his inheritance in Timnath Hears, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gosh. And all that generations also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Okay. So this means this is the third generation of the people. So the first generation was the people who came out of Egypt and who all died in the desert. The second generation is the one who came out, came out of Egypt when they were very young or the people who were born in the desert. So the, these first generation and the second generation was different. First generation was a Saul to worship the idols in Egypt. They ate the food. That's how they grew up. They're the one who actually troubled the Lord in the wilderness and kept, kept complaining. Then and just saying to uh, Moses, and why did you bring me, bring us out of Egypt and you know let us die in a desert? They're the one who always been complaining. So God said, "You will die in a desert." So that's why the first generation never, you know, um, enter into the promised land. So they all buried in the in the desert. But the second generations who learned to follow the Lord because that's all they saw. They don't know the life of Egypt, right? All they saw was when the pillar of a cloud, you know, lift up and move, and then they just start to follow. When the pillar of a cloud stops, literally they all stopped and they camped next to uh, the tabernacle. So what they learn in the wilderness is that when God goes, we go. When God stops, we stop. So literally that's what they saw and that's what they learned in the, the life of wilderness. So when those generations had seen the, all the miraculous work that God had done, drinking waters from the rocks, right? And all these things they have seen and experienced and they served the Lord as long as they lived. But the third generations who actually either enter into the land and were born, born there so they never saw how God led them or never seen, you know, a pillar of a cloud as leading them to promised lands. They just completely forgot about the Lord. So when you look at this, there's something we're missing. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? You know? There's cer certainly a reason why this happened. So, if you're not sure, we're gonna go back to um, Deuteronomy. Chapter 31. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 31. We're going to read from verse 9. Deuteronomy 
Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 9. Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priest, the son of Levi, who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, At the end of every seven years, at set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booth, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place where he, he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the word of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn for learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. So what did actually uh, Moses tell the Joshua and the Israelites to do? Yeah, every every Sabbath year, every Sabbath year, and gather them, teach them about the law, and let them learn who God is, and learn how to fear the Lord. Guess what? Do you think they did this? <laughs> they did not do this. Therefore, the people did not learn about Jesus. I mean, not Jesus. To learn about God. Since they don't know who God is, obviously they do whatever they think it's right. Now follow the law that a God has set for them. So this is one of the things that I kept mentioning to everyone. If you don't know the words, there's no way that you can serve the Lord well. Because you don't, you never learn how to fear the Lord. You don't know who He is. You don't know who you are. Therefore, you will never fear them. When you actually work for big organizations, who do you fear the most? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. You literally fear the 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 toppest person of that organization when he's actually looking for you for no reason. How do you feel? <laughs> you feel very <laughs> you you feel very awkward and say, "Why is he looking for me?" <laughs> right? So you fear the uh, the uh, the person who's in charge of the company. Because he has every authority to do whatever he wants. Because he has that authority. So he can either chop off or he can actually reword you. So he has every power to do so. But usually when you get called in for no reason and you know that this is not something good. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't know who the CEO is, you will never fear that person. But if you know who he is, when you actually encounter him, then you be careful with them because you know who he is. But if you don't know who CEO is, obviously, since you don't know who, who he is, you can be very natural to him because you don't fear him because you don't know who, who he is. As soon as you know him, then you 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 will be careful for what you do, what you say. That's what I kept saying. Many people say they worship the Lord. They they many people say like you know uh, they praise the Lord, they pray to the Lord, and they do all these things. But in reality, they don't know who God is. They don't know. Who which God they are serving, which God they are worshiping, which God they are actually praising, which God that they are praying. And they are just saying, I'm a good Christian. 
How could you be a good Christian if you don't even know the God that you're serving or worshiping? So then how do you know who your God is without knowing the Word? So if you don't know the Word, literally that means you don't know who He is. Because the only place that you're going to learn about Him through the Word. So this is why you must learn the Word. If you don't know the word, you don't know who God is. And truthfully, you confess yourself. I mean, how much, how much do you know about the Bible? <laughs> Think about it. You, you, you don't have to answer, but you just ask yourself, how much do I know about the, the, this, this thick book? How much do I know? <laughs> yeah, so you know. You don't have to answer to anybody, but you know. So, I mean, for you guys, that's why you're here to learn about the Lord. This is why you're learning the words and book by book, because you want to know Him. But when you look at the other people, they do read the Bible. It's not like they don't read the Bible. They do read the Bible. But imagine, how much do you think they're going to understand the the books they're reading, the verse they're reading, how much do you think they're, they're, they're really learning from this? If you just, by yourself, just keep reading the Bible. Of course, it's better than not reading, of course. But even if you do read, your understanding is going to be very minimal. You just kept re you know, reading the book without proper understanding. So, just not reading the book, but getting to understand his will, getting to understand how he feels, getting to understand what he's really telling us, is more important than just reading the Bible. So, what do we need to, to learn? Let's take a look at John chapter 6 for a moment. John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is Jesus feeding 5,000 people. So they were, they were very excited because Jesus fed them with bread. You know, all 5,000 who were gathered with Jesus, they were able to actually eat. And then when you look at the uh, verse 22, it says, On the next day the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boat and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, where did you come here? Or when did you come here? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you you ate, you're filled of the lobes. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to them, what must we do to to be doing the work of God? Jesus answered, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So, why did this crowd chase after Jesus? They were coming after the food. Because they were getting free food. They don't have to do anything. Jesus can Jesus can feed them. It's not like you don't have to work. 
right? Jesus will feed you. So as long as you go after him, he will feed you everything that you need, so therefore you don't have to work. How easy is that? So instead of trying to work, they actually chase after Jesus. Where is he? As long as we chase him, after we follow him, he will provide us the food that we need. So let's go after him. So what do they go after him for? Food. They did not follow Jesus because Jesus is the Son of Man. They followed Jesus because they were chasing after him for food. So Jesus knew what they were going after. So why did you seek me? You did not come to me because you wanted to have eternal life. You came after me because you want the you know, loaves of bread that you ate yesterday. So they're asking, what must I do? What kind of work should I have to do? And I said, what, 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 is, what is Jesus' answer? This is the work of God. What is the work of God? All you have to do is believe in him, knowing who he is. If you know who he is, you will believe him, and that's what you will go after. But you came after me, not because of eternal life, not because you want to live. You came after me because you want the loaves of bread. So how many people are actually coming after Jesus because they need what they want? Right? People do come to church. People do come and ask the Lord and pray to the Lord because they need something. They, they either need a job <laughs> because they, they're sick, they want to get healed, right? Because they're tired, they're, you know, uh, they're, they're in depressions. You know, they want some help. There's nothing wrong with that. Of course, you can come to the Lord because of you need something. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that's all you're looking for, you're just coming after Jesus for no re you know, for, for wrong reason. We come to church and we actually seek the Lord because we want the eternal life. Because we love Him. Because we want to do something for Him. This is why we actually come to church and this is why we seek Him. But as I mentioned before, when little children, they don't really care how much money their parents have. All they want is, I want this candy. I want this ice cream. I want this. I want that. They don't really care what your parents have. The only thing they desire is what I want is more important than anything, anything else in this world. Right? I don't care what other people have. I don't care what our parents have. I don't care what situations you're in. Give me what I want. When you're young, that's what you do. When you're children, that's literally what you do. But as you grow up, that's not what you do. You know, let's assume that you become, you know, adults like yourself and then do the same thing what you used to do when you were like five years old. You know, you're not normal. Right? You can't behave the way you used to, you know, behave when when you were five years old versus, you know, how you should behave at your age. So, now you worry about your parents, you care about what situation they're in, you try to help them, right? So, your way of thinking is a completely different from what you used to think when you were five years old. That maturity level has grown up so far now. So you think about your parents. You know, you know what situations they're in. You try to help them as much as you can. You try to offload their burdens to help them. You share their burdens. So we actually look at ourselves. You know, not from physical point of view, but we look. We should look at ourselves. What? What am I? Am I actually a child before the Lord? Or am I the, the adult? Who am I? But when you look at 
ourselves, when we look at the people who come to church, you can easily tell the people who come to church, some are very ch child, some are mature. You can tell the differences. You know, when you look at them, the way they pray, the way they actually, you know, worship the Lord, the way they praise the Lord, you can you can guess at least. It's not ac it's not accurate. Of course, we're not reading their mind, of course. But at least you can tell whether they truly came to the Lord for, you know, eternal life or something else they came to church for. Even us, we do the same thing when we need something. We come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need this, right? We, we do that. So, as we get to know Him better, and as we get to fear Him more, the way we pray, where we... You know how we worship the Lord, how we actually praise the Lord, and what we will do for Him is 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 going to continue to change because we are growing up. We're grown up, so spiritually we have to be grown up. But someday we feel that we're grown up, and another day we look like a child. We we're not always acting like adults. One day I acting like a child, another day I acting like adults. So I'm going back and forth. That's who we are. So we should not go after the Lord only for what we can actually get out of Him. So verse eleven, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baal. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who went around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunders and who plundered, uh, plundered them. So he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them to, for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Why God actually put us in this kind of trouble situation? Hmm? Nobody wants trouble in our life. Do, do, do you want trouble in your life? I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't know about you, but I don't. For certainly. But why... Why do we actually put into this 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 dif difficult situation? We forget him. Very easy very easy to forget him. So, let me ask you this. When you start your day every day, do you truly rely on the Lord and ask Him to help you every single day, every single morning as you walk, wake up? Yeah. So sometimes we forget and we just do what we do because it it is the routine work for us. We get up, right? We wash, we get ready to go to work and we go to work and eat lunch we continue work and we you know we get out of work we come home we either hang out with friends or like come home and eat dinner and either you know we watch a TV or read books or do whatever we normally do and go to bed and next morning we start the same pattern we're very used to this so we don't really need God to help us because I know what I'm doing it's the routine. There's no room for God to do anything for me because I can do everything by myself. I can talk, 
I can go and I can just pay, you know, my lunch, dinner, whatever, right? When I need something, I go to grocery, sh you know, get grocery. I can do everything by myself. I don't need someone to help me to do anything. So therefore, sometimes we forget that we have to rely on the Lord. So therefore, we don't totally rely on Him to do anything for us. Because we, we think we can do ourselves. And many times, actually, I wake up in the morning, I sometimes even forget to pray to Him. And I just do, I just start my day without Him. Because I, I can start my day without His help. But you realize that's when you're in trouble. That's when I'm in trouble. Because at that point, I trust myself that I can handle my by myself. I don't need his help. I can do everything by myself. But all of a sudden, when you're in trouble, then what do you do? <laughs> yeah, that you s start to seek to help because because you're in trouble <laughs> right so so now you need help so that's why you you come to the lord i'm a, i'm no different than you i'm the same exact thing so why did god put us in trouble so that we seek him not because he hates us because he's actually drawing near to him So, God did the same exact thing to Israel because they were worshipping other idols and they abandoned th the Lord. God actually brought enemies and take plunders from them and put them in persecutions. Because they are in trouble, now they cried out to the Lord because they are in a very difficult situation. And verse 16, then the Lord raised up judges. So this is when God raised judge, which is the um, Savior, literally, who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked who had obeyed the uh, commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whoever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after their other gods, serving them, and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. So why did God leave those people? To test them. And, and also have them actually seek the Lord because without them when they're in peace they forget the Lord they start to worship other gods they actually abandon God so they just you know walk away from the Lord so God used their enemies to put them into trouble so when they actually the enemies to persecute them and take the plunders out of them and then they started to cry it out because they're in a very difficult situation. So, this is a literally us. <laughs> this is us. 
when we leave you know when there's no trouble in our life we start to forget about the Lord because everything is going well and there's no issues in our life but when we put into uh, hard situations then that's when we start to look for the Lord I said Lord I need you I need you so why does God leave this enemies around us to test us whether we serve we continue to serve the Lord or not and then use that enemies to persecute me so that I seek the Lord that's who we are <laughs> this is literally us so what is the judges really telling us we're helpless people by nature by nature we will not serve him naturally we're so um, we're so foolish that we have to be in trouble to seek the Lord I mean we ask ourselves like why that's who we are <laughs> by nature that's who we are so this is why God actually puts the thorns into our life and then he pokes us and says oops ah, ouch then that's when we start to look for him you know in our head we know we have to seek the Lord every day of our life but that's not how we live we just know it knowing is not doing it knowing is just knowing it's not like we don't know we do know everyone knows it's not like we don't know we do we just don't live that way because that's who we are so throughout this judges God is telling us reminding us what kind of people we are this is you this is what you do every day of your life you forget about me I provide you everything what you need as soon as you get what you need you start to forget about me and you're not following me it's like our memories is fading away we all suffering from dementia literally So we have to continue to remind ourselves that God is my help, God is my rock, God is my refuge, God is my helper. We should never forget that. That's why he puts thorns in our life. Yep. Yeah. Yeah exactly yep exactly you know I need God's help we all need God's help so as I mentioned asking the Lord for what we need is nothing wrong but we don't just come to the Lord because we need something we come to the Lord because we love him because he's our Lord he's our Savior and he is our Lord this is why we come to the Lord that's what it should be and because he's our father when I need help I come to him and ask for help Lord you're my father I need your help Lord So hopefully we don't forget the Lord in our life. It doesn't really matter how much you know the Bible. It has to be part of our life, our daily life, not just every Sunday. Every day of our life we have to ask for the Lord's help.
Okay, so up to chapter uh, chapter two. Any questions up to this point? It's not a hard teaching. <laughs>